In this video, we're going to continue our discussion of the riskogram. And as we said last time, the riskogram is a way to visualize this information on SNPs and how SNPs can contribute to disease. Now, originally we looked at the sickle cell anemia case, which involves only one SNP, but that's a very rare case, and most diseases especially um, asthma, obesity, hypertension, diabetes, and, and many others, are much more complex. And they're more complex because they're influenced by multiple SNPs, in some cases many SNPs. Last time we looked at how to use a riskogram with just one SNP, but this time we're going to use a riskogram um, to calculate the impact of multiple SNPs. And this image here is just copied from the last video as a starting point. So down here we have our axis, we have our prevalence of 5%, and with SNP1, 9.52%. So we started in the USA, and that was our 5% prevalence. So 5% of people in that population have arachnophobia. Now, when we narrow that down, when we get a subset of the United States, now we're only looking at people with SNP1. Well, it turns out that SNP1 increases people's risk of developing arachnophobia. And we calculated that using the likelihood ratio. So now, let's look at a couple of other SNPs. Let's say SNP2 and SNP3. And I'm just going to make up some likelihood ratios for these. Uh, SNP2, we'll say, is 3.2 for the likelihood ratio, and SNP3 is 0.4. Now, we need to do the same thing that we did last time by calculating uh, this blue number, that percentage. And as, as you may recall, last time we had to convert the prevalence into a ratio, and then after we converted it into a ratio, we could multiply that ratio by the likelihood ratio, which was 2. And then we got a number and we had to convert that number back into a percent and then we could visualize it on a riskogram. So we're doing the same exact thing here. So we're starting with 9.52 percent which is the same thing as 0 0.0952. So now what we want to do is to create a ratio just like the likelihood ratio where it was two people have it to one that doesn't. Well how do we do that? We're going to do the same thing we did in the last video. So we start with who has it to who doesn't have it. 0 0.0952 people have it, and the rest don't have it. And when we do the math out, we find that this is equal to 0 0.1052, which is the same number we ended up with in the last video before we converted back to the percent. Now this number is the number that we, this is that what we called last time was our prevalence ratio, and that's not really a thing, but it's uh, essentially, you know, we're taking this number and we're converting it into ratio terms. Um, so now what we can do, since they're in like terms, we have two ratios, we can multiply them together. So SNP2 has a likelihood ratio of 3.2, and we can multiply that by the ratio um, given by our last SNP, which was the 0 0.1052, and we find that that is going to equal 0.3368. And now, once again, we want to convert this back into a percent. And in order to do that, we're just going to take the number of people that have it over the total number of people. And the total number of people is going to be 1 plus the people that have it. And how do we know that? Well, since this was a ratio, it was implied that it was 0.3368 to 1. So that means this many people have it, and one for every one person that doesn't have it. So that means this many people have it, which went here, and then over the total number of people, which would be everyone. So that's what we added. And when we do that math, we end up with 0.2 519. And that's really, you know, 25%. 25.1%. I guess we can say 25.2 and round it. Okay. 
Now our graph wasn't going to be able to accommodate that large number, so I'm just going to redraw it really quickly. And we'll still start at 0%. And this time we're going to end at, let's say, 30%. And then I'll put 15% in the middle. And so again, we started out with a prevalence of about 5%. And then we went to SNP1, which was 9.52%. And now we found that with SNP2, we're going to 25.2%. And again, we can do our check by looking at the likelihood ratio. And it's 3.2 to 1. So that means three, about three people have it for every person that doesn't have arachnophobia. So it makes sense that if you have SNP2, you are more likely to have arachnophobia. Now if we do the same thing for SNP3, the likelihood ratio here is 0.4. And I'm not going to walk through the calculation again. I'm just going to tell you that it's 11.87% is what we end up with. And that's about going to be right here. And does that make sense? Well, let's think about it. 0.4, what does that ratio mean? So that's really just going to be 0.4 to 1. Same with the other one. 0.4 to 1. So 0.4 people have it for every person that doesn't have it. That means that more people do not have arachnophobia than people that do have arachnophobia with SNP3. So it makes sense that if you have SNP3, your chances actually go down for having arachnophobia. And a really important thing to note here is that this is cumulative risk. Cumulative risk. And what does that mean? Well, you need your entire profile to be able to actually calculate your chance of getting the disease. And of course, there are other considerations, environmental considerations in particular, that can influence your chance of getting a disease. But in order to determine your, the genetic component of that risk, you need your entire profile. So you need all of the SNPs that could possibly contribute to that disease. So, for example, if we only looked at SNP1, um, that might not really give us a good picture of someone's chance of getting arachnophobia. Just because they have SNP1, it doesn't necessarily mean that their chances are about 10%. You know, maybe that person also has SNP2 and then their chances would increase. Maybe not only do they have SNP2, but they also have SNP3, and then their chances you know, are now towards 11%. Maybe there are other SNPs involved that we haven't discovered yet, or, or that we don't know about, um, and that would further influence uh, this, this particular person's chance of having arachnophobia. Let's pose a very important question. Can genomic techniques accurately predict whether a healthy person will develop a common disease? And the answer is no. At present, at least, the answer is usually no. So we need to look at family history and lifestyle. These are major contributors to a person's chance of getting a disease, especially for conditions like heart disease, diabetes, and arthritis. So, again, a riskogram is a way of portraying the genetic inform or the, the genomic information and, and calculating someone's risk. But other factors, right now at least, tell us more, like family history and lifestyle.